What most people don't realize is that dismissive avoidance often live in functional freeze. Things like stonewalling, shutting down, withdrawing are a sign of functional freeze. It often looks like a power play or a manipulation tactic. So in today's video, I'm going to break it down into the 15 signs of living in functional freeze. Now, even though I'm making this specifically for the dismissive avoidance, anybody can experience functional freeze, especially after a big trauma. Fearful avoidance might also identify with many of these symptoms. Hi and welcome or welcome back to this channel. My name is Patricia Mohatska and I'm a relationship coach. I help people to shift out of surviving. This is exactly what I'm going to be talking about. These parts of our nervous system that have learned survival tactics and insecure attachment and then we shift into thriving where we can have a better choice of how we're acting in our environment so we can have love, safety, freedom and health for our physical body as well. Thank you so much for joining me. All right, so let's just understand the difference between fight, flight, freeze and functional freeze. So we have our nervous system and in our nervous system, I like to imagine it like a gearbox. And this is a cool exercise that I really like my clients to do as well. So you can do it with me right now. And you can imagine where is your gear in right now. So parasympathetic is when you're in that juicy space of rest and digest. In this space, you're curious, you can see what's happening around you. Say, for example, you're driving, you're aware of the landscape, you're taking it all in. You can enjoy music, delicious food, you can enjoy conversation. So you are in social engagement mode, okay? So this is like neutral. But if we stay neutral all the time, we will not go anywhere. We need to get into gear. So a little bit of sympathetic nervous system activation is important. So this means a little bit of stress is good for us. You know, like something motivates you, like perhaps a work project with a healthy deadline that you know you can meet is motivating. Or perhaps you have workout goals that are motivating, you know you can meet them, so you wanna get up and you wanna do perform those goals. So that is like going into first, second gear and you just cruising maybe third gear but then when the stressor gets bigger our nervous system completely takes over so like the car decides okay you are not going to be driving me i am going to take control and i'm going to go into self-drive basically and the first two states that our nervous system wants to perform as a way of surviving is to either run away from the threat, which is flight. And you know you're in flight mode when you start to feel anxiety, worry, fear, and eventually panic. When you are in flight mode, your thoughts will be something along the way of, I need to get out of here. I need to leave this relationship. I need to get out of this meeting. What excuse can I make to not go to this meeting today? And this can be in relation to anything, to a work meeting or school or your relationship. It can also bring about thoughts of avoiding and figuring out like, what excuse can I make to not attend that meeting? Or how can I get out of these plans before I even go there? So that's flight. Sometimes dreaming a lot about holidays and you can even check your social media if your pages are just filled with travel destinations, but the travel destinations, instead of bringing you this um, joy, <laughs> they're making you feel a little bit sad that you're at work and you cannot be at, um, at, on a holiday. Maybe you are in flight mode. So maybe that is that reverse gear when you're just trying to get away from something. Dismissive avoidance often get into this when they are in withdrawal, but I'll talk about this a little bit uh, later on in the video. Now we have fight mode. So when we can see that I can't run away 
or on that day I see that this threat is smaller than me. So say for example, there is a big dog and there is a little dog, that big dog is gonna know, you know what, I've got the strength, I'm bigger, I'm stronger, I've got the skills, I'm going to take out this little dog. So when we feel like that big dog, when I feel like I am capable of taking on the stressor, I can approach and defend myself, I can fight. You know when you are in fight response, when you have tension or energy or restless hands, you can have tension in the jaw, the neck, the shoulders, because the jaw is a fighting instrument. And with our shoulders, we protect the neck, we protect the throat, and with our hands and with our nails, they are also fighting instruments. So our fight response lives in this area, you can so say. Flight, on the other hand, I didn't mention, lives in the legs. So restless legs at night can be an indication that throughout the day you were stimulated to flight mode. Now, when we are in fight mode, our thoughts will sound something like, I am going to tell this person where to get off. I am going to go over there and give them a piece of my mind. Or thoughts of resentment, thinking back and you might be angry and think, oh, I should have said this. Next time I see this or next time this happens, this is what I'm going to say. Those are thoughts of anger. So you are going into like fourth or fifth gear in your automatic car. You're going, starting to go full speed ahead towards the object of your stress. Now, when we are in flight and fight, energy gets redirected from the torso into our arms and into our legs, which basically means this is not the time to be all juicy and pleasure and digest all our food. It is time to just run or fight. This is why a lot of people, when they are in the state for too long, they start to get issues with digestion. This is mostly the first sign that the nervous system is not balanced is our digestion. And of course, it can be many things. Your digestive system could be a sign of the diet or probiotics. But a lot of the time when people have attachment trauma, which means that their attachment style has been stressful, their family life has been stressful since a very young age, of course you can imagine that this child wasn't stressed, they didn't know how to fight, flight or freeze, they had to just cope with the environment. Well, that sounded quite strange, but I think you know what I mean. So they had to just cope and they were living in that sympathetic nervous system overdrive for too long. They lost their way to just find neutral. And that a lot of people will say, you know, I used to teach yoga for about 15 years. And you can see how when people start yoga, at the end of class, we do that sleep time, which is called Shavasana. And that's very important because that's when we find that neutral gear as we learn to rest and digest. And when people start yoga, even when I started yoga, I was fidgety. I was just like tapping my hands and thinking like, okay, can we go now? Why, what is this? Why am I lying around here? I wasn't able to just switch over into the parasympathetic nervous system. So that's exactly the problem, is when we get stuck in gear, imagine that you can only drive your car in reverse, in flight mode, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's going to be really difficult, or if you can just be in fight mode and you cannot get out of it into that sympathetic nerve, in paras into parasympathetic, into rest and digest, okay, so that means over a prolonged period of time your internal organs are going to get stressed out, so this is why this work is also so, so important, not only for the health of our relationships, but to have a healthy body, and just on a quick side note, not to veer off too much, but autoimmune uh, um, diseases have also been linked to trauma. And I know I had an autoimmune disease, which was supposed to be incurable, but eventually I cured myself of it. But I had an autoimmune disease 
because of this prolonged stress that I was in in my nervous system. And I've experienced most of the stuff that I'm talking to you about and I also see my clients, whether it's yoga clients or coaching clients that experience this. So I'm going to give you a little tip, maybe not in this video, but in other videos on how you can get into a more neutral state of that parasympathetic. Now the next phase, say for example the threat is too big, too persistent and you cannot run away from it, you cannot fight it. The only thing that you can do is just simply freeze. Now freeze is very different to what happens with fight and flight. With fight and flight the energy goes into the limbs. With freeze mode, imagine like a deer in the headlights, when the deer is crossing the road and it sees a car, instead of crossing the road all the way, they just pause. And in that moment of pause, their nervous system decided that this threat that is approaching, it is bigger. You cannot outrun it, you cannot fight it, so you better just freeze. And hopefully this threat is going to go away because it's gonna lose interest in you. So while you're freezing, you don't know how long you're going to be in that frozen state. And I'll tell you how this relates to our childhood just now. So when you are in that frozen state, your body goes into conserve the internal organs because we might be here for days, right? If we were in the wild, we might be here for days until the predator eventually gets tired um, and finds a different prey or wanders off somewhere or thinks we're dead and not interested and it loses interest. So now all the blood is in the trunk, which means there's no energy to fight or to run away. Okay, so we are just in freeze mode, we are completely still. People when they are in freeze mode, very rarely talk, but when they do, you will hear them say a lot of things like, I can't, I don't know, uh, I, I, don't, I don't have the power to do that, I just don't have the energy to do that. So there is a lot of thoughts or words that say, I can't some version of our can't. This also links to the core wound of I am helpless. And how this links to our childhood is that when we are growing up, we are very well aware that our parents are bigger than us. We cannot outride them. We cannot fight them. So what we can do is to minimize ourselves. So when we see that the, like the dismissive avoidance often had in their house, perhaps they didn't get a lot of hostility. Some dismissive avoidance did, but there was a lot of neglect. There was coldness. There wasn't any warmth and emotional nurturing. So there was this distance between them and their parents, which feels to a child like a threat. Disconnection to a child feels like a threat. Perhaps the parents fought a lot, and the child decided, okay, I am just going to withdraw into my little shell and the, if I don't say anything, if I'm just a good child, just a quiet child, I read my book or I play on my TV games, I'm just not gonna get into trouble. And then they shut down, okay? So can you see that shutdown is a state of freeze, but it's not full freeze because freeze would basically means we are immobile, we cannot move. Now there is another part which is, I'm just going to mention it quickly, it's collapse. So collapse is past freeze is when we literally collapse or we cannot speak at all. But when we are in this functional freeze, we are just subdued. And what you will see is that dismissive avoidance are often subdued. They're slightly disconnected from the world. They're definitely disconnected a little bit from their bodies because they don't want to feel anymore what is happening inside of them. They are in that survival mode. So when it comes to conflict, their nervous system already picks up, oh, there's a threat. When I had this threat when I was growing up, it was too big. I didn't know when it was going to end. I didn't have any power to change it. Nothing I said, nothing I did ever worked. 
And you might actually find that when you speak to your dismissive avoidant, whether it's your partner or somebody in your life, they will often tell you that, I don't think I can do anything. When this person is angry with me or they're criticizing me or when there is conflict, I know that there is nothing I can do. They must just process their emotions, they must explode or whatever happens, let it happen. And I need to let it pass. Okay, can you see that it's a deer in headlights? I just need to let the th threat pass. Only then does the blood move away from the trunk, into the arms, into the legs, and then I can run away, right? So you can also see how when there is conflict, dismissive avoidance will do anything to get out of that conflict, which also means that they will appease. So have you ever had that happen when you are talking to your dismissive avoidant and you think you're having a really good conflict resolution and you're like, okay, I'm getting somewhere. I'm verbalizing what it is that I need and they're listening and they're agreeing and they're like, yeah, 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 okay, we'll make these changes, we'll make these plans, yeah, whatever you want. So you think, okay, great, this is gonna happen. We finally got somewhere and then it doesn't happen. And the reason for that is because they were appeasing. Their nervous system was in so much stress that in that moment, they're just thinking, I just need this to be over. I just need this to be over. I just need this to be over. Whether that is conscious or subconscious, they just want to get out of there. And another thing is that when people are in that state, they cannot fully use their cognitive function. This is why some people cannot, maybe cannot fully remember what was happening in the conflict. Maybe they feel a little bit dizzy, a little bit disconnected from themselves, disconnected from their emotions. They cannot access those parts of themselves. So this gives you more or less of an idea of the different states of the nervous system. Now I'm going to go over very interesting topics uh, or situations where this functional freeze comes up and maybe you can listen up and let me know if you experience any of this in your life. So the first thing I mentioned here is disconnected from body and emotions. So as children, dismissive avoidance had to do that because to feel everything was extremely confusing. They didn't know what to do with it and it was extremely painful. So they dissociate a little bit. Okay, so dissociate, they go into their head, they create a beautiful world in their head, and they don't really feel anything in their body. So number two is going to be tightness in the jaw, neck, and shoulders. So what's happening underneath this freeze mode for them is, um, is fight and flight, right? We still go through those responses. Their nervous system still wants to go to those responses, but because they have trained that freeze mode more, they predominantly move towards freeze. And this is what you will see with most of us. If in childhood we learned that we need to fight, like fearful avoidance will often become volatile and they will fight, or they will also shut down and withdraw. Anxious preoccupied might also tend towards fight. They also become the pursuer in, in conflict. And this is usually what causes the conflict to escalate even more and I'm not blaming anybody for it, it's just what happens. The dismissive avoidant gets into that uh, freeze mode even deeper because the stress gets bigger and bigger and bigger and they shut down more and more and more. And this is why it's so difficult to resolve conflict between these two different attachment styles or the fearful avoidant, anxious preoccupied and also the dismissive avoidant. So we really need to, if we want to resolve conflict in a better way, we need to understand like when they are acting like that, like, oh, they are the deer in the headlights. I will get through to them in a better way when they feel calm again, then we can have a normal conversation. But the tension, neck and shoulders, that uh, that is also an indication that a lot of people don't feel their torso. Like if you ask dismissive avoidance, do you feel your chest, your belly, pelvis? Mm, often not, often not. Even in yoga, when I had dismissive avoidance, they would often not feel their feet 
on the ground. So I'm wondering if you can feel your feet. Uh, and if not, this is a great exercise just to breathe. You know, if you can only breathe to your shoulders, maybe you can breathe a little bit deeper and slowly, slowly kind of, you can imagine yourself like an ice cube thawing out of that freeze mode and you can feel more into your body, which will be very healing for you. Number three, numbing behaviors. All right, so Netflix, social media, Sometimes it goes to some kind of uh, addiction, whether it's process addiction or um, substance addiction. Numbing from feeling anything is functional freeze. Number four, avoiding behaviors. So most people don't realize that dismissive avoidance live mostly with this like low level of anxiety and like a very low level of depression. Because when we're in functional freeze, we are not a full on vibrant selves. Right, our energy, our prana is not moving through us, blood flow is not moving through us fully. We are not fully alive and expressing. We are a little bit subdued. So anxious, dismissive avoidance tend to have a little bit of this anxiety that builds up in their system. They might not even notice where it's coming from. All the emails from work, they're processing that. Their subconscious mind sees that as a threat. Even when there is attachment trauma, just being around other people might seem like a little bit of a threat. Going to a shopping center might feel anxiety provoking to a dismissive avoidant who learned that people are not safe. Okay, the nervous system has learned that not from their own doing most of the time, but through their upbringing. Number four, so it's avoiding behaviors. So when they feel this anxiety, they withdraw. Okay, so isolation. So withdrawing is flight. Then we have shutdown and stonewalling. And that is the freeze response. Number five uh, is conflict. So they will become non-responsive a lot of the time. We think it's stonewalling, and yes, some people use stonewalling as a manipulative tactic. I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but when the person in front of you turn, turns a little bit pale, and if you tune into their energy, it feels a bit dizzy, they are in a freeze response in their nervous system. So I was there too. I used to freeze and stonewall until I've learned about it when I started doing yoga I was young I was still 22 and I've learned about freeze mode and I got myself out of that freeze mode because I started to notice what it would feel like in my body that shut down it would just be like I like my torso was a cement block and I just felt stuck like I had you know somebody corrected me on here the other day because I said I felt like I had my one foot on the gas and my handbrake up in my car and this was way before polyvagal theory you know before I knew anything anything about it but this was my own experience and a lot of people feel that freeze is like having your one foot on the brake the other foot on the accelerator and then you're not going anywhere right like your car is revving but you're not going anywhere and then when you are going somewhere but you feel like you have so much resistance that's pulling on you like you're pushing this massive rock up a hill just to get out of bed and brush your teeth almost like a little bit of depression right that is functional freeze number six helplessness I am helpless. So that is the core wound that gets triggered. And you might have heard already from other sources on the internet that dismissive avoidance often get triggered into this helpless state. And the fearful avoidance often really don't like this because they experience a lot of trauma. So for them, they think like, I can't always be the one who is resolving all the problems. You need to come to the party, stop being so helpless, just get yourself together, right? And the more we act like this with a dismissive avoidant, the more the shell closes and they clam up even more. Their nervous system sees that as a bigger stressor. Now, number seven, when we are in functional freeze, we will often seek stimulate stimulants. So coffee to get up or some kind of adrenaline inducing activity, whether it is an adrenaline sport or sometimes risky behavior, whether that is 
calling an ex uh, to get your blood pressure going or it could be things like porn to get some stimulation to get into some kind of gear and get the nervous system going. I know when I was in functional freeze I used to go to work my work started at nine and then I would wake up at six because I would just sit up in bed and I would stare at a wall for like an hour or two and I'm not even joking before I could actually get my feet out of bed and go and brush my teeth and this is a little bit personal but maybe some of you will relate to it I used to sit there feeling that I need to tinkle and I used to wait and wait and wait until my bladder felt like it was nearly going to explode because I was just I couldn't move all right, so this kind of thing, it's not because you're lazy, it is because the nervous system is in functional freeze. Another thing that happens um, with functional freeze is that we can use sedatives to help us calm down because even though there is no energy in the limbs, in the arms and the legs, the little heart is still beating. Is beating and then aware of the, the reason why I say the little heart is because they did experiments with children and they saw that the submissive avoidant kids looked very calm when their parents left but they were not calm on the inside the nervous system was still interpreting this as a big threat but on the outside they didn't cry they didn't call for mom or dad they were just completely calm and that's what you will see with many dismissive avoidance. They might look calm. Maybe there's something big that happens, you know, like a car accident. And they will be the people that will be the most rational because they have mastered this functional freeze mode, cutting off from their emotional self and just living in the head and analytical, like a what has to happen next. So they still feel very revved up at night. So that's why some people smoke some weed, some people drink, some people use other sedatives, sleeping pills, to get them to down-regulate. Down-regulate is that part where we just switch over into neutral, where we are just relaxed. Now, sex issues. All right, so when we are under stress, there is very little thought about reproduction at that point because we are just in survival mode. So things like premature ejaculation, uh, low sex drive, difficulty, difficulty climaxing, um, performance anxiety and sexual shame are very, very common with dismissive avoidance. Now, number nine, I don't know if you have heard this before, if you experienced it, but dismissive avoidance hoard resources. So other attachment styles might call them selfish, especially people like anxious, preoccupied and fearful avoidance, who just give, 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 um, might see the dismissive avoidant as very uh, protective of their own resources. Maybe they don't even like to share food. <laughs> so um, that is because also we are in that survival mode where we want to protect and preserve and conserve. And this is why they don't want to share their food or maybe finances. And I'm not saying this is everybody. It's some people. Number 10, sleeping too much or too little. Procrastination is another one. Number 12, in conflict appeasing, which I've already talked about, so I'm not going to go over it. 13, fighting, not fighting for the relationship. Okay, also a big big pet hate for, of the anxious preoccupied and the fearful avoidant is they always ask, why doesn't my partner fight for the relationship? I am here, I'm ready to fight for the relationship. Okay, but that's you are in your fight part of your nervous system. They are past that, they are in freeze. They are like, I'm helpless. I cannot make changes in my life. I cannot make changes in this relationship. This is why a lot of dismissive avoidance will watch you walk away and they will not fight for you like the other attachment styles will do. And that is not wrong from any perspective. It is just understanding that we all have a nervous system. We all have a preset, you could say, that we have trained to go into under stress and that is what their nervous system um, does and functions. 
And the last one is not planning the future. And if you've ever dated a dismissive avoidant before they did any work on themselves, they will very rarely talk about you and the relationship in the future because they think, I don't know how I will feel in the future. I don't know if I can manage this in the future. I don't know if I can um, fulfill my partner's needs in the future. How can I fulfill my own needs in the future? Okay, so they will not really want to project and think about the relationship in the future. So what can you do when you are in this functional freeze and you feel like you're just going very slowly nowhere? A lot of people will try to immediately get out of this place and, you know, do yoga and stuff, which is a really great thing to do. Doing yoga is beautiful. However, I would suggest feeling into your body uh, very slowly and progressively opening up those neural pathways in very gentle ways so that you don't necessarily re-traumatize yourself. I know I did it the other way around because I didn't know what I was doing. I wasn't really guided. I was going to therapy at that stage when I started my work. You know, I started my work rather early when I was 19 years old and that I did from studying energy and James Redfield and Celestine Prophecy, a little bit of Buddhism, um, so I studied spiritual perspectives on the mind and energy and later on only did I get into therapy um, and I didn't really get information about being re-traumatized. So when I started yoga, I was crying all the time. So I don't know if this happened to you before that you just cry you know you do a yoga posture and you're like why am I crying I am just doing a stretch and all of a sudden all of these tears came up so a lot of stuff can come up when you're doing these practices and if you feel that you're okay to handle that go for it otherwise do classes like trauma-informed yoga I've also done uh, trauma-informed yoga teacher training so maybe someday I'll post some classes for you um, somatic experiencing, but all of these things have to be done slowly. What I really love to do and help people with is first understand what do we do when emotions come up? What are emotions in the first place? And once they have all of that backup knowledge, then do we get into the body? Then do we open up everything that is happening inside of us so that when it does come up, you know how to handle it and then you feel empowered. Now you feel like that big dog energy where you're like, I can take on the stressor. Maybe not in that fight mode, but I think you know what I mean. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I'm gonna make a few other ones about the nervous system. If you have any specific questions on this, please let me know down below. Thank you for sharing as always and for all the love this channel and um, these videos are getting. I'm so glad they are helping you. I love all your comments and I love meeting you. Thank you for coming to my coaching sessions. I love to see you. So I'll meet you next time. Big love.